Hi, everybody. Uh, I would like to kick uh, off today's discussion by first of all introducing the amazing women, women that we will get to talk to uh, today about this important topic. Uh, with us today is uh, Dr. Gul Ege. She is the Senior Global Director for SAS uh, IoT Research and Development. She's leading advanced analytical components innovation for SAS's global customer and partner stakeholders. She leads a team of world-class scientists helping SAS customers and stakeholders solve complex real-world problems. Uh, she has held various engineering positions across uh, SAS R&D for the last 31 years and more, and has a PhD from North Carolina State University. Also with us today is Jenna Tuttle. She's been in the software industry for more than 25 years, and even though her college degree started in education fields, she quickly found herself in the software industry and spent most of her career in product management, where she is now currently the head of product for Nexus and has been working with our Maestral team for more than four years now. Uh, today with us as a panelist is Mayra Khodzic. She is the Chief Product Owner for Corporate Finance at SAP Intelligent Enterprise Solutions. Uh, she has an MBA from the University of Economics in Prague and experience in finance and tech, product, people management and agile leadership and ways of working digital transformation are some of her main uh, areas of expertise. She's passionate about finance, automation, AI, blockchain and the circular economy. She's also been a very strong advocate for female empowerment throughout her career. Uh, another one of our amazing panelists today is Neda Cvjetic. She's the Senior Vice President and Head of Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Driving at Stellantis. She leads the Global AI and Autonomous Driving Software Engineering team that's supporting uh, creating breakthrough capabilities for all Stellantis brands. Uh, prior to Stellantis, Neda has held several engineering and product leadership roles in autonomous vehicles, AI, and computer vision at NVIDIA, and was also the producer and host of Drive Labs. Uh, prior to NVIDIA, Neda was a staff engineer on autopilot and infotainment systems at Tesla, and she served as the adjunct faculty of Columbia University and has held several senior research positions at NEC Labs uh, in the U.S. Uh, she holds a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Virginia and many uh, granted U.S. patents and peer-reviewed uh, publications. Another one of our panelists today is Sanya Bogdanovic Dinic. She is an engineering and delivery manager at HTEC Group. Uh, uh, she has been fascinated by the power of data and involved in uh, research uh, activities uh, since university. Uh, she has never stopped and she is part of our uh, R&D efforts and driving uh, the data science and data engineering team at HTEC Group. Uh, her experience spans numerous industries and domains and she's worked with a number of HTEC clients, including in the areas of maritime, I'm consulting media, knowledge management, and software as a service. Um, these are the amazing women that we will talk to today about uh, gender bias in AI tools and algorithms. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we really want to make this an interactive session, so we will kick off with uh, a series or intro questions, uh, but let's really uh, have the audience drive the discussion today. So feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A. And also, if you want to raise your hands, uh, please do so. I also want to note that today's event is just a kickoff for what will be happening over the next two days. Uh, we will be joined by students from across the Southeast Europe uh, region uh, for two-day idea marathon where they'll be working in teams with HTEC mentors on developing their own ideas and solutions uh, to solving the issue of gender bias uh, in AI. Uh, on Friday, you can also join us at 4 p.m. to hear uh, how the students have tackled these issues and we will be picking uh, a winning team that will get uh, some really uh, great prizes, uh, including uh, mentorship sessions and uh, different uh, learning uh, tools and support. Um, to start off the discussion, um, yesterday I had a little uh, conversation with ChatGPT on this topic. I uh, wanted to uh, hear some of the ideas this particular tool had on gender bias in AI. And I just wanted to share uh, with, with the panelists my impression from this uh, brief conversation with uh, ChatGPT. Um, I, I first of all asked the tool if it was uh, uh, gender biased, and um, it clearly stated that uh, as an AI language model, it does not have a gender or possess personal beliefs or biases. Uh, its sole purpose is to assist and provide information to the best of its ability without any prejudice uh, or discrimination. 
Um, I also asked uh, ChatGPT if uh, people have identified uh, gender bias in some of its responses, and I find uh, this answer particularly uh, interesting. Uh, ChatGPT didn't admit to anybody identifying uh, gender bias in, in its responses, uh, but said that it strives uh, to provide responses that are neutral, unbiased, and informative. Uh, it also said it's possible that users may perceive uh, gender bias in its responses due to the way language is structured and cultural biases that may exist within it. I found uh, this answer to be very interesting and I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on it afterwards. Um, it also was uh, slightly apologetical in the sense that it said if anybody has identified gender bias in its responses, it apologizes for any unintended uh, impact that the language uh, may have caused. Um, so there is no uh, full admittance of, of there being any gender bias, uh, uh, but it's stating its uh, intent to be unbiased. And I would love to discuss with you how uh, uh, an uh, AI language model can have uh, such an intent and how you build that. Uh, into the system. Um, I also asked ChatGPT what are some of the challenges associated with gender bias in AI, and I thought it did a pretty good job there of identifying uh, top five challenges. Uh, these were lack of diversity in data, uh, something I think we'll disqu discuss quite a bit today. Uh, cultural assumptions in language, uh, again, something I think uh, uh, several of you may want to tackle today. Limited understanding of gender as a complex uh, issue. Uh, lack of transparency in AI decision making. And finally, limited representation of women in tech uh, as one of the main causes of gender bias in AI. So uh, I think uh, this summary is uh, is pretty good, but I think there are a lot of new nuances uh, uh, that need to be addressed today. I'd like to start off the discussion with uh, Gul. Gul, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, I already mentioned in the intro, uh, you've been uh, part of the SAS engineering team for many years in various positions and now are leading the R&D efforts in IoT. I wanted to get your sense of whether you've seen, especially over the last few years, uh, different examples of uh, AI-based tools displaying gender bias uh, and how these have had a negative impact either on companies or uh, on individuals. Have you witnessed any of this? Yeah. Um, SAS is the most productive and a trustworthy um, AI analytics platform. So it's essential that we uh, provide to our customers um, equitable, uh, trustworthy, ethical, and sustainable um, AI modeling environments. So um, we can get into that later. I know it's very, uh, we are very passionate about this. I am very passionate about this, but as a company, we are passionate about this. And, and many of our uh, customers in different domains, especially those that are regulated, are very sensitized to using an AI model uh, uh, for for their purposes, but I came up with some funny um, examples for the funny and sad, I guess. Um, examples for the crowd. There is a, a website uh, that I found out. It's called incidentsdatabase.ai. Um, one of the funniest examples is if you put uh, an image search for a CEO. Um, there's 11 rows of men, and the 12th row has a female, which happens to be a Barbie. Barbie is a little girl's toy. So I hope they've corrected this search. Uh, but there's also more serious ones. I think a technology firm was trying to use AI for uh, recruitment going through the resumes. Um, it was recognized a few months later that they're interviewing hiring mostly men. <laughs> and um, it is because, I assume, they trained it um, on, on a data set that was mostly hiring was done for men. I am sure they have corrected this. Um, but um, that's another example that was fixed. Um, I, there are other things like uh, I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey. My language doesn't have a he or she. There's a gender neutral third party. Actually, it could be not, you know, it could be a train or a car or a person. 
<laughs> so a translation engine was given some statements where the third party or uh, was a doctor or engineer, nurse, hardworking, lazy, pretty. So it's very interesting that it was mapping all the strong, hardworking engineer doctor to a he and um, mapping the um, more pretty nurse teacher uh, to to a she. And yeah, I, I find that very interesting. It's like um, so bias exists in the world, um, not just gender bias, other biases too. And AI is designed to work like the human brain learning from previous things. Like we all, like for example, if I'm the first Turkish people person you met and you feel I'm horrible, the next Turkish person you see, your brain for efficiency will start that person's assessment in a negative. Uh, and uh, so um, I, I think um, it's training ourselves for and our models to change or remove as much bias as we can from the data as well as the models is the goal. That's what we work on. Can you tell me a little bit how a company such as SAS has organized either internally or process wise or in the uh, in the process of uh, uh, developing new technologies uh, systems uh, in place to ensure that this type of thing doesn't happen? Uh, multiple things. Uh, one is we have a, a group called data ethics uh, practice reporting directly to our CTO. They're responsible for sensitizing ourselves within the company, as well as providing advice uh, for our customers. Their mission is uh, to make sure data empowers people, all people not some people, and uh, that uh, we innovate, uh, to, to, to reach that we innovate um, responsibly regarding the et ethical stuff. We have also built uh, out of the box tools uh, with a user interface um, through the analytical life cycle. Uh, one of them, Analytical life cycle is starting with the data, then modeling, then taking that model to uh, production environments and monitoring your models over time and uh, keeping track of the decisions that were made um, and whenever is reasonable to retrain the models. Um, I think the biggest first step is to challenge your data. I mean, sometimes people feel, ah, oh, if I remove gender, um, out of the data, it won't be gender bias. Absolutely not true, because there are many other proxies that could be biasing your opinion, I mean, your data. I think it's important that the data is balanced, the training data. So if, uh, like the example I gave about the technology firm recruiting, if 95% of the data you have are male, even if you remove male, there are other things. Men's soccer championship, fraternities, and stuff like that. So it's it, it that's not that's a very um, badly imbalanced <laughs> data, and uh, those need to be corrected. So we do provide um, uh, um, statistics on the data you have, missing values, that general data quality, but in addition to that, doing correlation analysis between any variable and um, uh, your target variable in the AI, um, and then um, helping you address that by identifying what is private in the data, what is a, su a suspect <laughs> in uh, building bias. And then when we move to the modeling step, we also provide um, uh, bias measures as well as other, all the other statistical measures. It's very important to the domain AI models, unlike regression models, for example, 
are not naturally understandable, um, especially if you're not in the field or a data scientist. So we provide natural language interpretation of the AI model, what it is doing, what it is focusing on, et cetera, so that um, uh, the, the those who are going to accept this model and make decisions based on that can buy in in the model or have objections to the model. I think that acceptance criteria should be definitely um, definitely be reviewed and accepted by a diverse group. If the if the modeling can be done by a diverse group, that's better. But uh, I, I think uh, SAS has given us all training on inclusivity, diversity, and um, bias. Um, and I think that was very valuable because most people don't know they're biased. It's an unconscious thing that's happening. Um, I mean, um, if you ask men, is there gender bias? Most people most of them would say, oh, I'm not biased. And like, so who is? <laughs> because definitely gender bias uh, ha happens. So I think um, training and sensitivity and the tools like SAS offers uh, to make things clear to the about the model and your data will help us remove the human bias out of AI. And I think there are other things we can do, um, especially like this group, um, to improve the gender bias by example. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gul. Uh, Neda, you have uh, worked on applications of AI technologies in different companies and, and in different uh, industries. We heard a little bit from Gul on what companies can do to make uh, data sets and, and models uh, more diverse or to be more aware as companies of these issues. Uh, we also heard in the beginning that ChatGPT mentioned uh, transparency in AI decision making as one of the factors uh, that leads uh, 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 to gender bias in AI models. Uh, I wanted to hear whether you agreed with the this assessment that ChatGPT made, but also what you think engineering teams uh, can do to prevent this. I do. I really do agree with the assessment. Actually, it, it displayed a, a really high degree of self-awareness, if I can say that. Um, it, it was really interesting to me when you said also, if you notice anything about us being biased, uh, sorry, it's not intentional. Oh, I, I almost expected them. No, no, no. But but I almost expected the model to say, "Please label it and send it to us, so that we can include it in our in our data set and close our our data gap." Uh, probably that's the next step. Um, but yeah, but but that you know, as Google was saying, it's it all comes back to the data set. So do you have coverage, uh, or do you have statistical gaps? I mean, you know, in in our domain, we saw even before AI that these gaps existed. So one example that I like to share is that when crash test dummies for accidents were first, where they first came into the safety scene for automotive, they were only built for male profiles. There was no woman crash test dummy. There was no child crash test dummy. And probably this was not intentional, but you can think about the group building this, right? It's it's a homogeneous group, and of course, you know, they're influenced by their own experience. Without an additional training, without an additional sensitivity, you don't think about your your global population, right? And I think fundamentally, this is why diverse teams build the best products, because they think about customers who look like them, who think like them, who act like them. Um, and for us, it's Stellantis being a global brand, uh, you know, having four hundred thousand people all across the world. Uh, this is why it's so great that we've got engineering teams in Europe, in North America, in South America, in India, in China, and everywhere, um, because they represent our, our population. So I think one thing that companies can definitely do is have your engineering teams who are creating these data sets, who are building these models, represent your customers. Have them be like your customers um, as much as possible, because that really does help. Um, and it's really important for us because if you take this, you know, data gap and diversity challenge um, into AI and AI for autonomy, I mean, think about data sets that are supposed to use AI to detect pedestrians on the road, right, for the car to avoid them, and them not knowing, right, <laughs> what different genders look like, what different races look like, what different age profiles look like. 
I mean, at this point, you're running the risk of the AI not recognizing a human being on the road as a pedestrian based on some, you know, bias of a protected characteristic. That's as disastrous as it can get, right? And so this is why covering that, you know, diversity in the data is, is incredibly important. And I think one thing definitely, you know, companies can do is make sure to address that uh, directly on their engineering teams. The other thing that you mentioned is this lack of transparency in AI decision making. Uh, again, very insightful comment, both from you and from Chad GPT. And um, one thing I can say is that I've definitely seen an evolution in my industry on that. So if you go back to, let's say, 2008, 2009, the way that these AI models for self-driving were trained is that they would take a camera image in and produce a steering and braking command out. Big black box, big end-to-end -end black box. How did you get to that steering command from that picture? Not much breakdown, not much explainability, right? How would you then retrace that? How would you justify that? Very difficult. And so then the industry realized we, we can't do things this way. Yeah, you can produce that command, but there's not a lot of transparency as to how the vehicle did that. So then it was factored. You have a software block that just detects the world. You have a separate software block that then fuses different sources of information. And then another one that combines that into predicting where the car is going to go. And then another one that issues the command for steering and braking, right? And each of those then independently becomes explainable and traceable. And so I think that that's one thing that's really, really critical. You you cannot necessarily, um, because you're not hard coding the problem with AI, you're not telling the machine what to do and that's how you get the performance gains. But you should be able to explain how it got to where it got, you know, from your data set and from the way that you're factoring the problem. So I think that that, you know, as far as transparency and decision making um, is the way that, that uh, you know, is the way forward, uh, that, that uh, explainability in AI is, is so fundamental. Neda, you're operating in a heavily regulated industry for safety and, and other reasons. Is that helping foster these discussions uh, and uh, increasing transparency uh, in the AI process? Or uh, is uh, regulation um, having a tr trouble following the la latest when it comes to technology in this area? I, I think that technology is still leading regulation uh, in this area. Um, I think um, regulators are still in some sense trying to wrap their mind around what this is <laughs> and how to uh, institutionalize some best practices for it without completely stifling the technical developments, right? Because it does increase safety. I mean, look, you look at things about, you know, detecting, uh, detecting possible, you know, uh, people behind the car uh, when you're, you're backing up, detecting, you know, uh, children or, or pets that are left behind in a hot vehicle. All of these are really good things and we want to you know, keep the, the technology going. But this is not like it was back in the day when these you know, legacy functional safety standards were created. You don't validate the same way. You don't, you don't check for things the same way. And so I think this is a great opportunity for, for us as technologists to be thought leaders that help the regulators come up with the right best practices. And some, some of those that I'm seeing uh, are, are literally guidelines around bias or ethical usages of AI or, you know, best practices in terms of you have to have institutionalized versioning of your models, right? You have to have traceability. You have to have explainability. So, for example, in your compute infrastructure, in your data infrastructure, all of this is traced and documented to a way that if a regulator were to ask you, how did you get to this model, you could literally reproduce it. Step by step, I know exactly what my hyperparameters were. I know exactly what I changed from my data sets. I know exactly where I pruned this layer or changed this layer. I know exactly why I re-architected this to look like this versus that. So I think those are the kinds of things that we are now beginning to speak to regulators about uh, and in some sense are taking shape as, I would say, best practices you know, regarding AI development in the industry. So I think we'll get there, but for now, technologists are still leading the way, which I think is a great opportunity to make really good uh, and sensible regulation, because it's always good when regulation is informed by those hands-on working on the problem who've been doing it uh, for a while.
Thank you so much for this uh, perspective. Uh, I also wanted to ask uh, Jenna, we heard from Neda and, and Gul uh, coming from an engineering uh, perspective and, and Neda had a really strong statement which resonated very strongly with me, which is that diverse teams uh, build the best uh, products. Yes. Uh, yes. I wanted to ask you from a product uh, standpoint and this is where your career has been uh, focused, um, to tell us a little bit about uh, why this is important uh, and how we can tackle the issue of gender bias at different stages of the product development life cycle and, and what is important? Is it just the diverse teams or are there processes that you can put in place uh, to ensure uh, product development uh, is uh, aware of these issues and addresses them on time? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, diversity has been a problem um, in software and tech, every aspect uh, for most of my career. I can definitely remember the days where I was the only woman in the room, or I was the only woman on the floor um, working on software. Um, and now the, the ratios are becoming a lot more balanced. In fact, I was in a meeting the other day and there was only one man and the rest of us were all female. So that was a nice turn of events. Um, I think having, a, you know, one of the things Netta said, having a diverse team makes a huge difference. Um, having women represented in the room, having them participate in design and requirements and testing makes a huge difference. Um, also, the cultural differences. You know, we also use teams in Europe and in India. Uh, we have people from all over the United States as well. And even within one country, there's different perspectives and, and, and bias associated with those. And so the more diversity you have on the team, um, the more opportunity you have to make sure what you're building doesn't introduce that bias. Um, the other way that you can address that, which is really comes down to the product management and the requirement side of, of, of building any product, is identifying your user community, right? Um, I know when you all met last year, you talked a lot about improving women's health and how technology improves that. And that even though tech is built by most, most code and most software applications have been built by men, um, if the requirements that it went into what they built were written correctly, that doesn't necessarily automatically mean there's biased, right? If they're thinking about the fact that a woman is using this um, and they're testing it with a woman, if they're doing usability studies, and they're putting people in front of that of different by uh, different races, different uh, re, um, cultural backgrounds, different genders, um, and um, modeling how they use the applications or how they use the tools, um, and then taking that back and making sure they're enhancing the application to account for those differences, then they're working toward eliminating that bias, um, which is another way to do that. Um, but the, of course, the, the simplest way, um, but also the most difficult way, is to make sure that as a team, you have all that representation in the room. They're all part of the process and they all have a voice at the table, uh, which is the other big component of it. Um, you may have, uh, you know, I think as women have entered into uh, the software industry specifically, we started out as the tech writers and then as the testers, right? If we're listening to our testers and we're listening to their feedback um, as part of the design process, if they're part, a, a seat at the table, even though they're not the ones writing the code or even writing the requirements documents, but they still have that voice, that also helps to remove that bias. Now that we're more on the front end of the process and there's more of us um, doing the design and the requirements, talking to, to customers, being that voice for the product um, and, and not only with our customers, but also with our development teams, um, that also helps to remove that bias because we're able to translate that information uh, that we're receiving in a different way necessarily than, than our male counterparts would, would do. I think in some cases, um, especially when I talked about uh, the meeting I was in recently where there was all women but one man, right? You, we also have to be sensitive to going in the reverse and also not thinking about, you know, the other side of the equation. Um, so it's it's a really interesting challenge for us as, as a global community and within tech to make sure that we are representing everything. And a lot of it, especially with AI, comes down to the data set that you're using, 
right? Um, most of the, if, you're, if, if your AI model is built off of resources that you find out on the internet, such as with ChatGPT, well, let's face it, most of the content went, written on the website were probably written by men and probably written by young men, which has a different aspect to it necessarily than, than the rest. So it's important that we have that sensitivity to it, the visibility to it, and that we as women are contributing as much as we can to kind of help alleviate and balance that current imbalance in the data. Thank you so much, uh, Jenna. Um, I also wanted to uh, ask uh, Sanya, we heard a little bit uh, from uh, Neda on how to uh, improve this transparency when it comes to uh, AI decision making. Uh, you've been very vocal about ethical use of AI and working with our clients. You've been able to support them in, in developing solutions that uh, that uh, support this premise. Um, uh, and in a recent article, you talked a, a little bit about the importance of uh, governance that needs to be built into the AI pipeline. Uh, can you uh, explain that a little bit uh, to the audience, why you think that's particularly important? Uh, well, governance is uh, actually the essential part of uh, building the deploying, delivering successful AI solutions in general. And uh, if we want to avoid bias, this is the way to do it. Not only bias, but uh, every ethical concern that we have with the solutions that we are building. This is the way to do it. Uh, this is very important topic uh, that we are putting on the table when we are talking to our customers. And uh, when we are approaching governance, uh, we don't only approach governance uh, from the perspective of technology. This is also very important to know. Uh, it's a very complex, broad topic, uh, broad model that has to be put in place. And uh, it concerns not only technology, it concerns data, it concerns people, it concerns impact that this solution will eventually have um, on someone who will be in the end using it. And when we are talking about governance uh, in data, then we are talking about how well do you understand the data that you have and that you are working with. Do you know why do you have it in the first place and what do you want to do with that data? And um, how is that data going to help delivering that business case or achieving uh, that business goal that you have? So it's a big win when we are actually able to tie that data set that is residing somewhere with a business KPI. Uh, that's when you actually show them what it means to be data driven. Uh, so it's very important to monitor that data. Uh, to worry about the quality of data. What does it even mean? And what kind of quality metrics are needed to exist and be put in place in order for this solution to uh, actually uh, deliver the right value? And then when we are talking about people, we are talking about diversity, diversity of the teams that are involved in the process from the very beginning to the very end. So it's about who is designing the solution, who is thinking about the product, are we ha having uh, a diverse teams that uh, have enough experiences, diverse experiences that are relevant for uh, the use case that we are working on uh, to actually design the best possible solution? Who is going to be part of the development team? That's also important. Who is going to be part of the labeling team? Uh, then we are talking about governing processes. How is that data being collected? How is that data being labeled? How is that data being validated? And in the end, machine learning models that are definitely going to be built at some point, how are we going to validate those models? And how are we going to track uh, their performance and uh, accuracy? And uh, um, how are we going to know that they are still valid and relevant when they are being used uh, on production? And finally, impact. Who is the receiver of the services that we are uh, building and developing and uh, offering with the AI solutions? And what are they expecting? And are those expectations met? And since this is very broad, really broad and really, really complex topic, it really depends um, on data maturity of the customers that we are working with. And the exact topics and communication varies, uh, again, dependingly on um, where they are 
now. So when we are talking with uh, some of the customers that are at very early stages of uh, data maturity, meaning they are just entering the data field, they have some products, platforms, user base, but they are really not data driven. The greatest challenge there is helping them go through that big, big mind shift because they are uh, about to go through another transformation, a data transformation. And that is a huge change of thinking because up until that point, data was a static resource. And the default way of thinking about data was not thinking about data too much. And all of a sudden it's becoming a fluid asset that is actually driving some of the decisions that is uh, impacting and influencing business outcomes. So when we are talking with customers at those early maturity stages, then we are really focusing on education and uh, really focusing on explaining what the governance means. Because if we do it right, we are going to establish a solid foundation for the governance and for eventually delivering trustworthy uh, and explainable and reliable solutions in the end. And as they mature, well, the, com the communication changes, obviously, uh, because uh, as, as they grow and uh, as they learn about data and uh, as they use data more, they're starting to actually uh, uh, identify opportunities themselves. And they are start starting to realize the value that data is bringing. And then we are talking about governing the models, governing the processes, governing the impact that their solutions will have in the end. Um, so the communication is different, but it's always about governing data, governing process uh, or processes, governing people uh, and impact that the solutions will have. And of course, technology. I'm really glad you mentioned uh, building trustworthy uh, products. Uh, I think, um, you know, Google mentioned some examples in the beginning. I'm sure we'll hear a few more during this discussion of kind of negative uh, um, applications of, of AI technologies or negative outcomes of such applications. And I think it would be a shame uh, to lose faith uh, uh, in uh, the power of AI because we are yet at the beginning to see uh, how much good it can bring to the world and all the positive impacts it can generate. Neda talked about some of the uh, positive uh, things in the automotive sector and the impact AI can generate. Uh, so uh, just, you know, bearing in mind that we need to along the way build uh, the trustworthy products is super important uh, if we uh, don't want to see faith lost in AI as a technology. Uh, Mayra, uh, I also wanted to ask you, we heard both from an engineering and a product standpoint, uh, different uh, perspectives uh, on this topic. Um, SAP has also been very uh, vocal uh, in the importance of uh, kind of countering this algorithmic uh, bias and they've introduced uh, uh, you as a company have introduced a number of measures uh, in this area I wanted to hear a little bit about not just what SAP uh, has been doing in this field but also what your personal experiences have been and whether you and your career uh, have witnessed uh, any uh, examples uh, that you want to share of technologies reflecting this kind of uh, societally built-in uh, biases um yeah, I mean, I first of all, I really enjoyed the the sort of the discussion and the exchange we had so far. A lot of a lot of earth, um, great insights, uh, and I'm actually happy and pretty proud to to hear all of that and then to share that that actually a lot of what we've discussed we uh, we try to do at SAP, uh, but we are also very huge, so. Um, so a lot of different segments are pretty much necessary if we want to make any change or we want to make uh, anything work. Um, diversity and inclusion overall has been one of the main focuses uh, that we have. And uh, obviously, we're not at the end of the journey. The journey never ends. But I, I think, and especially after hearing all the, all the ladies here, I think we're on the right path, and I'm happy to hear that. Um, so what we do, the way we do it or the approach is pretty simple, uh, but I believe it's pretty powerful and it's pretty typical for SAP. So it's a sort of end-to-end -end perspective and value generation. Whatever you do, do it end-to-end, -end, start from the beginning all the way uh, until the final piece and then you make it work, right? So people, processes, technology, and it's a little bit of a, of a kind of synergy of everything we've talked about so far. Uh, and, and obviously we could then even build further. 
So on one side, we have a very strong compliance guidance and governance. Like uh, it all starts with a global IA ethics policy. Uh, it starts with, uh, with um, the entire bias, uh, the diversity being strongly and very tightly embedded in all the compliance policies that we have, with the committees on AI we have, uh, particular cases that are specifically dealt after the testing or validation that they need to be changed, reapproved, or completely like shifted um, or directed a different way in order to make sure that we basically are following the objective criteria. So a lot of things on, 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 on this side of the house and on sort of the governance and compliance with a little bit Sanya was talking about, right? Um, and then the most or like the central piece when it comes to the technology and the processes would be the transparency. And I, I like to call it end-to-end -end transparency, the entire chain, right? Um, so uh, we have really, um, and that's what we've been known for, uh, among the other things, right? Is a set of sort of the rules and the, and po not, not policies, but rather the processes in order to ensure the end-to-end -end transparency, explainability, um, that you make sure that from the beginning to the end, you have, um, you have a good product, high quality product, and with minimized bias. So uh, just running through the example, uh, the designers and developers, um, there are certain rules that they need to be explained why, how, um, what technologies are being used all the times. So they need to be documented, they need to be communicated and made available to the end user and the customer, right? Um, obviously, it's always adjusted to what we are actually doing right now. Um, Starting there, then the data, the validation of the data, statistical correlation, everything else, make sure that we have a right representation. And how I always like to say, we make sure that whatever happened in the past does not end up in the future. So we might have had a certain data set and they are the way they are. You mean you can't change that if you have a, a very typical and a simple um, the data set for the hiring. If you had a certain X, Y, Z um, group of um, of hires, be it white males or whatever, not it doesn't really matter. The thing that you need to make sure is that the same doesn't happen in the future, right? And uh, so, so different validation and the testing, and based on these outcomes, again, certain um, steering committees that will di direct it the right way. Uh, an important part here with the validation is not only when you're building it, it's also to revise your objective criteria. You have to. It's like a like introspection, right? You ask yourself, okay. We have a certain criteria, we think they're objective, we think they're sufficient and enough, are they? Do we need more? Do we need to redefine them? Did we find out something else and we need to add upon it? You know, so this kind of sort of a continuous improvement, even on the on the on the on the things that are already in place and they're working really well. So that would be that would be uh, another piece like focusing on basically the data sets and and then of course the the continuous work also with the customer, right, and the end user to making sure that um, that it all works, that we have a, uh, re a right representation of uh, of the intent uh, of the um, of the outcome, and uh, also the diverse teams to deliver it. What we also do a lot um, is we invest a lot in learnings, right? Um, it's a it's a powerful way to change mindset, and honestly, more than any kind of other change, what we need is a change of a mindset. The more we start changing that, the less our data will be biased. And this is, I mean, very simple to say and very difficult to uh, to um, implement. I completely understand that. But in any case, the learning can be very powerful, right? Um, in any kind of way. And um, an interesting thing that I actually found out by preparing for this panel was that one of uh, one of the most popular and really, really, um, I don't know, uh, liked and cool and even made free accessible uh, learnings on our uh, open SAP platform, where we have all kinds of certifications and everything, uh, is actually AI ethics, where we also share our best practices. And it, yes, let people find it very helpful. So, so feel free to check it out. Um, so it's, 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 I was, really, I was really proud when I read that. I was like, yes, great. So things are working. Like you know, the, it's people. It's not only about what you do as a company or whatever. It's like people see the importance of it. People want to go and invest their, their, their private time and their learning into learning about AI ethics. Great, we're moving somewhere. You know, from different kind of perspectives. I didn't look into into who was attending the and the the learnings, but it doesn't matter, right? Um, another cool thing uh, that that I just wanted to share, and maybe that again, talking a little bit about trust, Katarina, keeping it right, and and making sure that we believe. Um, the example from last year, there is um, there is a new initiative called the Women and AI Pledge. It's kicked off by and please bear with me. This is a French name, and I don't speak French, uh, so it's called Circle um, Antaral. 
which is a network of networks of uh, 16 market leaders in tech, uh, fighting for over two decades on uh, in increasing the num number of women in STEM careers, so doing great stuff. And their main focus since last year is basically this pledge to AI. And the greatest thing is that the uh, the industry wants to work on that. This is also a good sign, right? In, in, in that, that we want to do it, that we we have it in mind that it's a it's a challenge and it, it takes time also. We need to be patient. Uh, but but the good things are ahead. And I mean, maybe the last, and I'm gonna stop talking, um, is uh we walk the talk, or at least we try to walk the talk, right? And uh uh, the diversity uh, of the teams, uh, the number of women in management, and I mean senior management, and also our global head of AI is a woman. So uh, pretty, pretty a lot, I would say. And um, but it's just the beginning, right? We can have all this in place, but uh, but we need to change the mindset. And these are all, in my opinion, just the enablers to to kind of lead us the right way, so that tomorrow, whatever comes out from here. Uh, is less biased and it's the data is going to be less biased as well. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, feel free to drop a, a link to this uh, SAP AI ethics uh, training in the chat here. I'm sure a, a lot of our uh, guests, especially the students who are watching us, uh, might be interested uh, in uh, looking at this uh, resource. Um, also, a reminder for all our attendees, you can leave your questions uh, uh, in the Q&A or feel free to raise your hands and join us uh, uh, in the discussion uh, as well if you want to share your thoughts uh, on the subject. Um, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit. Uh, I think I think I can conclude from listening to all of you that it's really not uh, the te technology that is uh, uh, biased, but it's uh, society that that has this uh, bias and technology is just picking up on on data sets which have historically been built on um, on uh, different uh, uh, biases uh, of the past. And I love what Myra said about not repeating uh, what has happened in the past, but uh, being more uh, future looking and uh, and changing the mindset. Um, we talked how to remove move gender bias out of AI, but I think, you know, we are only in the beginning uh, of seeing how AI uh, will, uh, you know, uh, impact our society uh, in a positive way. And I want to hear your thoughts on how AI can improve, uh, you know, inclusion and diversity and improve gender bias in society uh, as a tool. Are there different industries where you can see AI creating a big impact in the coming years in this segment? Uh, or have you thought about maybe in your uh, fields of work how you can use AI uh, on this particular topic? Cool. Uh, do you maybe have some thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, the society and the workplace bias, it seems to be better every five years. When I started my career, um, I was um, uh, the second uh, uh, analytical developer in a rather large large R&D. Now, like my own team is uh, 40 to 45 percent female. Um, and we are <laughs> almost like United Nations. There's somebody from every country. Um, so um, so it is improving. I think AI, definitely AI and analytics in general can uh, help um, improve the outcomes of the models if done correctly. Uh, if one is sensitized to detecting bias, but I think in general, the move to less gender bias is going to be um, the next generations being exemplary uh, professionals, female, that they can be. <laughs> and um, so if people start um, working with women, that does a lot of um, bus add business value to the team. The next woman that comes up, will they would have adapt to it uh, much faster. There are still industries or tables um, that is mostly men. Uh, I think Jenna was mentioning. Um, I'm hoping five years later there's less of that, <laughs> uh, and and I think uh, most of the audience that will see will be part of that change. Um, and not be the problem. <laughs> um, so 
I believe in AI if it is appropriately used, and this is where we in SaaS put a lot of effort into it. Um, I think the future is bright, hopefully, maybe in, you know, when these students' children <laughs> are getting to a professional life, nobody will worry about, am I alone on this table? Because it feels weird suddenly, um, if especially if your team isn't built up like that. Um, and this won't be an issue. And it's not only gender bias, there are other biases as well that needs to be addressed um, universally. Does that make sense? Thank you. <laughs> um, Neda, do you have, uh, uh, can you anticipate industries in which uh, AI can create this, uh, this kind of positive uh, outcome for women? Yes, um, all of them. <laughs> So I think I'm with Ghoul on this one. I mean, whether it's online gaming or healthcare or automotive or, uh, you know, social media or what have you, supply chain management, uh, I think it applies to all of them. The most urgent thing to me is to get more women building this stuff, right? No more barrier to entry out of the tech industry. No more barrier to entry into these, these fields. No more hesitation to jump in and to participate, right? I mean... If you look at this industry, it's, it's just changing the world. Uh, AI, it's making its way into like election conversations. So to have so much of the population not participating hands-on is really bad and is, is going to have a bad effect on every industry. But I think the converse is also true. So really, to me, it's like no matter what industry you're in, no matter what you're passionate about, ultimately, the challenges are the same. You're going to tackle the same fundamentals that we talked about here. Uh, and so the the more women that we can get doing this hands-on, feeling empowered, building this stuff, contributing in concrete hands-on ways, the more positive impact we're going to see, frankly, across the board. Uh, so to me, that's that's the key thing. And that's why I'm really do happy that we're doing uh, events like, like this one today. So thank you for organizing um, because it's very powerful doing stuff like this. Thank you so much, Neda. Sanya? Yeah, I heard this crazy thought like uh, inspired by uh, recent um, publications of AI so to say or delivering AI solutions such as ChatGPT or uh, Midjourney or others publicly uh, to all of us uh, and I have this crazy thought that this might be actually a good way uh, to fight the existing bias why um, these models right now are biased and uh, they are mirroring uh, that unconscious bias that uh, exists in, in the society and all the content that is used for training the models and uh, delivering the solutions. But we are talking about that constantly and the models are improving. And I hope that one day that bias uh, will be minimized or zero, hopefully. And these publicly available models are so popular and have so big reach. And imagine having uh, these models available uh, to all of us, having this reach and being unbiased. That could change the, the, the that could actually be the solution for the unconscious bias in a way. It's a crazy thought, but we can hope. Yeah, I mean, I think this this response I got from ChatGPT on whether people have identified gender bias and and how it recognized its its desire to not be biased, I thought was really interesting. Um, and on the other hand, we've seen examples of similar, you know, generative AI tools becoming really, <laughs> you know, displaying racial slurs in the course of 24 hours of discussions with people and so on. Can you as engineers kind of guess why um, it happens in one case and in this case uh, it doesn't? Uh, so it must be the teams working on these tools that have uh, carefully uh, thought this out in a way. N um, I, I I think my understanding is Chat GPT is trained on anything that was ever published. Um, it takes a while to train. So um, and it is very often apologetic and tries agrees with you. Like I've heard of an example when 
uh, three plus one, it responds with four, which is correct. And you say, um, no, it's actually five. You're wrong. ChatGPT apologizes. And from that point on, in that conversation, one point four, one, one, ah, one plus three is five. Uh, so I, I think in other things too, how much of history do we want the training data to have? Uh, because if you look at the data or publications from 30 years ago, uh, maybe we shouldn't even worry about that data. I mean, uh, mon you know, a woman joining uh, tech technology jobs does not go back 100 years or 200 years. So I think when we know there's definitely bias, gender bias or some other bias, Maybe we shouldn't even um, put it in our uh, modeling database uh, so that AI can be more progressive um, and less biased. Thank you. I think that's a that's a really strong point. Uh, we have a couple of questions in in the chat from the audience. I'd like to uh, address those now and and then go back to a few more that I'd love to ask you all. Um, there's a question from uh, for Neda, and it relates to uh, when you were discussing kind of the transparency in uh, AI decision making and how you need to unravel this black box between the you know data and the outcome uh, of and that's very important uh, uh, in building these types of tools. Uh, there's a question on how this type of disclosure can impact uh, IP and patenting. Uh, it can impact it in that you can patent the way that you're factoring the problem. So that's in some sense the good news. And and not everybody's going to factor that the same way. You know, different folks may choose to train their AI to perceive traffic lights in a certain way. Others may to choose to do it a different way. Then how you use that information, for example, to put it onto your map for the car is also different, uh, you know, between different parties. In some sense, that's where the that's where the intellectual property sits. That's where it resides. How you factor that problem, uh, starting with how you define your ground truth, right? Because because the way that you teach the car to do something or, or teach the AI model to do anything really depends on how you choose to create your labeling guidelines. So even what you choose to label, what you what you choose the, the, the AI model to learn uh, is your intellectual property, is your differentiation. So you can even patent that. And then uh, from from the rest of it, like the entire pipeline of how you factored it is is patentable. And that is exactly how you build up your intellectual property portfolio, frankly. And and that is where your uh, competitive advantage uh, with respect to your, to to others uh, resides. If you can, for example, do it in a way where your false positives are lower simply because of how you labeled your data and how you factored that problem, then you're going to outperform. Right. Uh, if you can do the task at hand with fewer compute cycles because of how you factored the problem, uh, you're also going to have a competitive advantage. So I think that a lot of the creativity sits exactly there. And what I would encourage um, folks to do in this hackathon is when you're thinking about your ideas, uh, think about how you would then drive them into execution along these lines as well. What would your competitive advantage be in terms of your labeling guidelines? How are you thinking about factoring this problem in a way that gives you an advantage of what's over what's out there while also being explainable? These are really, I think, the key things that 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 uh, make a solution stand out. Thank you so much. Uh, there's one more question, and I think any of you can uh, try to tackle uh, this one. Um, it goes like this, uh, since we are hopefully aware how biased our real world data is coming from the real socioeconomical conditions, and since it seems like we're optimizing towards building larger and larger models that rely on increasing amounts of data, how do you think we can approach uh, to actually curating these data sets? Uh, and uh, if it is even possible to train a large language models without having uh, built in biases? There's a follow-up as well. Start, yeah, I Go can ahead, just Maida. start very, very shortly, and then um, then the other colleagues can build upon it. Well, one of the one of the ways that always when I when I think about it, uh, right? Um, again, it's it's a bit going public. Uh, why not enabling that the innovation and and even the correction of bias happens when it occurs, 
I mean, we cannot do that with all the models. I'm completely aware of that. Uh, but there is there is great examples, uh, not only with AI, but from the tech world, right? Um, in the past, when when you made a platform and you um, you basically made it available to anyone, anyone who wants to code, anyone who wants to give you your the idea or, or improve something and make it better, that basically um, this with um, with with us getting more um, more hands on and more involved could actually help to. Uh, to prevent it. So let's assume that you use a certain AI model for something, the one that you made public, right? And you detect a certain bias. It doesn't have to be gender bias. It can be anything. You, you also detect, okay, it doesn't have to be bias. Let's assume you detect an error. You can go and fix it immediately, right? And the more the more we also talk about it and try to change a mindset, let's assume that, uh, that we have... Uh, women who, who wants to code, who wants to fix it, who wants to provide this additional data that would drive it to, towards the more unbiased piece. That's how we could, that would be one of the ways how we could actually um, change it and make it better. So opening up some of the models where applicable, basically, um, you know, so that innovation happens anywhere and it, it comes from anywhere. So any good idea or any detection of anything negative, be it an error or a bias, can be actually fixed. This could be one of the, in some areas or in some models, uh, a good way to go. And then the data set would be actually, it would be, it could get balanced uh, by the natural force, because I'm sure that we would get more proactive in, in making sure that it is corrected. Uh, Myra, it's a uh, uh, it's a great point. So do you see any challenges, or how prone do you think companies would be to to speaking publicly about uh, uh, identifying these errors? Because it would certainly help uh, everybody, but uh, it's tricky. It it is tricky. This is always. Uh, I mean, the Chat GPT gave an answer, right? That that basically it hasn't been detected, and that they apologize in advance if something has been detected. And for example, even if if I could understand that they cannot really say yes, this is 1,255 uh, so far. <laughs> gender biases have been detected. Obviously, let's uh, we don't have to go that way. Um, but um, honestly, offering to to actually being able to say this, what what Neda said, and I was expecting the same thing. I was expecting to like, write us. You know, tell me, did you detect a bias? Write me, and then like maybe I'm not going to change anything. But you know, it's it's a new data set, so this would be, let's say, a first step. I think it's going to be difficult, and I think, and maybe this is a, I don't want to say controversial, but sometimes not always accepted. But sometimes the uh, the governance and compliance and the regulations help with that. And uh, this is where, you know, technology leads it. Technology has to lead it in terms of, oh, my God, what everything it can do. And it's powerful and it's awesome. And now the regulation is reactive to figuring out, okay, what are we going to do with it? Because we need to make it, you know, good for everyone. So I think this is exactly where regulation can come and say, guys, so how about this, this and that to, to, to not make it so taboo to accept even and say, yes, there has been some gender bias or any other bias and, you know what, we fix it and we want to fix it. So well, and you know, the the transparency side of it, um, I think you're you're spot on. I mean, who was the the CEO from Microsoft the other day went on the news and said, We apologize, it's a new data model. Yes, we didn't know yes. it was gonna do this. And you know, I saw that as just a tremendous leap forward, right? Um, because it is just being open and honest. It, it also goes to what Netta said about protecting your IP and your patenting. You can explain to your user community, to the regulators, you know, what the system does without necessarily going deep into how it does it, right? And how is really your intellectual property and your patenting and your protecting. I also think, and this would be controversial probably any other audience, that the more women that are in technology, the more transparency there is because we as a gender tend to be more open, more honest, and we tend to not be so focused on necessarily the perception of ourselves as individuals as we are the perception of the team, right? So for us, it's not necessarily about my ego as a CEO of a company to say, well, if I admit it's wrong, then I'm a bad person or I've done something wrong. We as women tend to look at it as, a team effort, collaboration, 
uh, we're more in that mindset. And again, it's it's genetic. It's just the the facts of being women that we think that way. And so I think the more women that are at the table, the more women that are in those leadership positions, the more we can expose those sorts of that sort of honesty and transparency, which as a result mo- removes the bias as we move forward. I mean, it's a it's a cycle. It's a cyclical. Um, uh, it, 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 it one begets the other begets the other. Um, and so I think it, it's it's going to be really fascinating to me. And it's fascinating to watch what's happening when the companies are open about issues and being willing to say, yeah, we made a mistake and here's what we're doing to fix it. And wow, this is new technology. We didn't know we didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, but now that it's happened, we're going to fix it. That just accentuates the trust that your consumers have with you, right? Um, And it'll be interesting to see if that trend continues to grow over time with these new techs that come out that people just can't wrap their heads around. How can a car drive itself? I don't understand it. Um, They need that level of communication uh, and they need that level of understanding to trust it. So being as open and honest when you find an issue, again, just builds on that trust that you're trying to establish. I think this level of transparency is super important for uh, building trust in the long term. Uh, we'll mention in the beginning the example of this AI based hiring tool that led uh, to more men or a lot more men being hired uh, in, in the company. And, and this is a documented example. If we're thinking of the same one, the result of this finding did affect, you know, it was on the cover of New York Times, affected the stock prices of this company. And as long as markets are Punishing uh, these types of discoveries, uh, it will be very difficult for companies to be very uh, transparent about uh, uh, identifying such errors. So I think we can all do a better job of, you know, like you just said, a good job for Microsoft for going public and explaining what happened and how they want to be better in the future. So um, I think that type of behavior needs to be rewarded and not uh, not punished in the long term. Yeah, uh, I think. Traditionally, the statistical models like regression and whatnot, when you're modeling multiple models, you choose the champion model you're going to put in uh, deploy uh, based on statistics of fit. (laughs) How well did it do? Uh, As we move into the AI models and acknowledging our data is biased, um, I think, and this is why, we provide the bias metrics against statistical. So businesses need to uh, accept that maybe you need to go with a less accurate uh, model to remove the bias than just go by, you know, how well did I fit it? Uh, so I think it's a, it's a, um, a leave it to the business user how much of this bias is acceptable once you quantify it it's a choice they need to make does that make sense (laughs) absolutely (laughs) thank you Gul. uh as we wait for further uh questions uh from the audience i'd like to take a little bit of time and uh maybe give some advice to the students who have to uh come up with their own ideas over over the next uh two days and who have joined us today um i think from this discussion uh they can already see there's a number of very interesting topics uh that can be tackled uh to summarize we talked a lot about how to improve the data sets themselves uh how to improve uh transparency uh in the process uh jenna said something super important on defining requirements and understanding your customer uh when building products and we talked a lot about uh diverse teams and how uh to get uh, uh the right uh, um diverse in the teams that are actually building these products. And, and I think there are a lot of ideas that students can uh, can develop around all of these areas, uh, but also on how AI can positively impact other uh, issues uh, uh, that women have in society today. Um, 
Can each of you share maybe one piece of uh, advice for the students? Uh, uh, what we are trying to do is not a, a classical hackathon. Nobody's expected to code anything in 24 hours and spend sp sleepless nights uh, um, uh, producing uh, lines of code. Uh, the idea is to really uh, give them two days uh, to develop a very innovative idea uh, uh, and uh, to really focus on all the aspects of this idea, whether it's the business side of the idea, whether it's what uh, and how technology is society uh, solving a particular societal or business problem. Uh, so I would like to hear from all of you, uh, maybe just uh, a, a piece of advice that comes to mind right now uh, for uh, for the girls that will be working in teams. Uh, maybe Jenna, we can start with you this time. Oh, wow. I was afraid you were going to start with me. Um, <laughs> I would say, you know, the best ideas come from honesty and from collaboration. So I would say as you're meeting with your teams, you know, talk about the problems you're experiencing, the issues that you're having and be honest uh, and be truthful and be yourselves. Um, I think a lot of times as women, we feel the need to put on some sort of facade when we're meeting with our counterparts, whether it's other women, whether it's men, re you know, regardless, we feel like there has to be a difference between our real self and the self we present at work. Um, and, you know, that's something that for myself, I've, I've, I struggled with early in my career and I kind of reached the point at, at some, at a certain age where I'm like, you know what, I just don't have the energy to try to be two different people all the time. Right. Um, and that's one of the pieces of advice I try to pass on to, um, a lot of the people that, that I work with and teams and, and individuals that I mentor is your best opportunity is just to be yourself and to bring your true self to every experience you're having. Um, and if you do that and you learn that trick a lot earlier than I did, you're going to save yourself a lot of stress and, and uh, anxiety, and you're actually going to end up bringing more to the table than you would have as that other person that you were trying to be. Um, so that's the advice I would give is look at the problems you have. Share the problems you have with the group, um, and you'll find that out of that's going to come some really innovative and great ideas. And I personally cannot wait to hear what you come up with um, on Friday. Thank you, Jenna. I can resonate with that 100%. I can see Neda also resonating strongly with that sentiment. Uh, Sanya, uh, you, you have developed so many, um, worked on so many products from conceptualizing ideas to delivering solutions. Uh, how can you advise uh, uh, the students? I'm not even sure what to say after Jenna, to be honest. <laughs> Because uh, whatever I say, it's not going to be as strong as what Jenna said. And I uh, said, and I think that that is really, really important message. We all have bias. I'm biased. You're all biased. We are all biased. And I think understanding that and accepting that is the first step towards finding that great solution that is not that much biased. So I have to agree with Jenna here and just say, Get to know yourself first and understand yourself and understand your point of view and allow yourself to be biased because we all are. Thank you, Sanya. Neda, can you add to that? I will try. What's been said is pretty amazing, but I'll do my best. Um, I would say my advice would be to leverage the momentum here, the ideas that uh, we're discussing and then and you will be proposing. Uh, and then and then go beyond that. You know, we can't code in these two days, but take the time after this to start turning it into real things. Play around with open source tools, with open data sets, with models. Um, don't be hesitant or uh, afraid to get hands on with this stuff. Uh, and the sooner the better. Uh, so that's what I would say. Use this as momentum to then also get really concrete, really hands on you know, uh, take those courses that, that are related to this, grab those internships, because this can create really great momentum for you to really get into the field and then build a really exciting career in AI. Uh, and then when you look back, this would have been the moment at which you decided to take that leap um, and, and change the world because maybe 20 years from now, because you built something, the world would be better. And, uh, and that wouldn't have happened had you not jumped in. So that would be my uh, advice and my request, actually. Uh, please, 
please do this after these weeks, this week's events. Thank you, Neda. Uh, Myra? Yeah, it's pretty difficult to say anything. Uh, um, everything goes in the same direction, and I and I really love it. And I think it's it's been very inspirational, not only for the for the girls, but but for all of us. At least I feel that way, and this is amazing. Um, so when you're building, thinking about it, uh, I've read once that Einstein said that if I had an hour to solve the problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes solutioning. So think about the problem. And solution is then the easy part. So whatever you want to focus on. And um, one thing that always stick to me and it always worked for me, maybe it works for you. You have to believe in it. You truly have to believe in your idea. And then whatever that is, whatever comes, then it's worth it. And it's really, really bringing value. But if you if you don't believe it, if you don't buy in it, then um, then that's not it. So those those maybe would be would be the the pieces I could share. I can double down on that. Uh, I've been to many events where startups have uh, pitched their ideas, angel investors nights and and events like that. And it's always uh, those teams uh, that are presenting why they wanted to tackle uh, the issue they're tackling uh, that stick with you and resonate with yes. you. And and those are the cases you always remember. Uh, someone who had a really strong story of why they wanted to solve a particular issue or develop a particular technology. And uh, I think that's uh, very important as well. Uh, Gould, do you have any final advice uh, for that our has students? Been wonderful uh, advice already given. Uh, totally agree with all of them. Uh, one thing, I would like to point out is everybody who's listening, uh, they can be the agents of uh, change uh, to lower the bias. I was early on in life, my mom always told me, there's nothing you cannot do if you set mind to it. I've taken it to heart. Never in my career or personal life have I thought, oh, I can't do that because I'm a woman. This gender, please keep that totally out of your mind uh, in your profession because that that would limit you. You would be part of the bias problem. So definitely uh, counting on the next generation to um, enjoy the seat they have on the in the table um, on the table and um, be very confident you deserve that seat yourself. And gender is not a professional attribute. So um, don't let uh, the negative side of societal gender uh, bias let you limit yourself. That's Thank you, Gul. There's one more question from our audience that I'd uh, like us to address. Um, uh, Maria uh, mentioned uh, that uh, Neda spoke about how regulatory frameworks in automotive are still reactive uh, rather than proactive. And uh, Myra also added that the same seems to be true for AI in general, seeing how fast it is uh, evolving. Uh, the question is how much effort is put into changing it to make it more proactive in terms of predicting potential negative scenarios rather than reacting to them. Um, so uh, how much efforts uh, are being made to better identify that something negative could happen, uh, whether it's uh, gender or race biased uh, uh, type of issue? Well, the, the the primary folks that I see trying to predict right now is uh, is Hollywood, um, you know, with Megan and uh, Terminator and Skynet. I, you know, they've they've sort of hijacked this a little bit. Um, I think um, creating a lot of hype of what could potentially happen if suddenly now the neural network that I trained to detect traffic lights becomes self aware and decides to cause a zombie apocalypse <laughs> somehow magically from this data set on traffic lights it was able to jump and 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 make these connections um i don't see how this is possible uh but you know but but it certainly sparks the imagination so i think that this somehow needs to be reined in right this needs to be reined in people need to understand how this actually works you know you you train things for a task 
uh, and uh, and and so I think that that the key thing really is is what we're trying to do in terms of helping the the regulators catch up, right? Getting them up to speed on what the technology is. What does it do? What does it not do? What are the limitations? You know, Sanya was talking about data integrity, incredibly important, garbage in, garbage out, you know, not garbage in and then self-awareness and consciousness out. Um, so I think that that's, uh, that's the key thing, uh, really, to to then shift the, the focus from negative away from crazy hype to really concrete things, most of which I think we talked about today. So I think, you know, events like this and then educating the regulators in the same way will help move us from this kind of reactive space to a more proactive uh, approach. Thank you, and Amanda, diversity. So and diversity, uh, if I can add to, to all of that, because having a, a single point of view is definitely not going to get you anywhere. Great points. Thank you both. Um, to, uh, we have a few minutes left and how I would really like to use these few minutes unless the audience uh, uh, adds uh, uh, something else, which uh, will, of course, be a priority. Uh, but, you know, to have these diverse teams um, that are building uh, uh, these uh, uh, products that are aware of all these issues and, and are responding to the needs of, of uh, their users, uh, we need to see more women in positions uh, that are, you know, either in engineering roles or product development roles uh, in the tech industry in general. I think, and I've always found, and, and for myself personally, at least that's been the case, um, one of the most inspiring uh, ways uh, is to really have uh, role models uh, uh, that you can uh, look up to and that can really show you the path of, of where you can be at some point in your life. Uh, so I would really like to use these few minutes to share with our students why you have found yourselves uh, in the tech industry. Um, we don't have much time. You all have amazing careers, uh, but maybe there's one event, uh, someone or something that inspired you uh, to be part uh, of the tech world and dedicate your life to this. Uh, um, Ul, can you get us started? Yeah, I, um, I, I got trained. I got my PhD in um, decision sciences, which kind of combines engineering, computer science, statistics and all that. And as I was doing my thesis, my advisor told me, did you check SAS? And I didn't know at that point anything about SAS. So I took the job they offered um, because I thought I'd try it for a couple of years. There were so many opportunities given to me. We solved so many different problems. Um, I didn't stay only two years. Um, but it was like when I got the job offer, it was like marrying your first boyfriend. I, I, I didn't know what else was there. Actually, I was thinking of going and working in Disney because they were, they had a lot of engineering computer science projects opening at Epcot. Uh, yeah, I love what I do. <laughs> and uh, I, I think it's important everybody picks a career that excites them, Makes them passionate. Yeah. Uh, that's if you don't enjoy your life, I mean, your work life, and you don't feel you're growing, that's that's not uh, the right place to be, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I had an interesting entry um, into <laughs> this career. Um, I started as a high school history teacher, right? And my husband is actually a software developer. And he was working on a project at home. I was looking over his shoulder. He was trying, bless his heart, to build a UI. Um, and he's not a UI guy. Um, and I was offering advice, as most wives do. Um, and he looks at me and he goes, you know, you're really good at this. You should think about doing this for a career. And I'm like, they pay people to do this? Because, again... From where I'm from in the in the country and the time I was born, this the, this type of career was wasn't an option for me, and it was really my husband, a man, of course, but my husband that introduced me to this and supported me in my idea to you know what I'm going to give it a shot. Um, and then similar to what Ghoul had um, with her experience with SAS, once I was in the door, the opportunities just 
almost seem to fall in my lap, you know, um, and it's almost I find that the industry is thirsty for the perspective and the uh, and, and the, the, the diversity that women provide. Um, so it's not as much necessarily and there still are those pockets where you find that they're resistant to it. But for the most part, in my experience, and especially with the younger generations that are coming behind me, they're open and want that ex- that that perspective. They want that experience. They want to understand, and they want to collaborate. And I think that's that's been really really key for me. And like Google, I absolutely love what I do. There's nothing as exciting to me as writing down what I'd like and having a picture and build and working on it with a group of people and then see it come to life um, and get delivered to customers. That's really, really the the money for me. Um, and uh, and yes, to Google's point exactly, if you don't enjoy what you're doing, if you don't go to work, want to get up in the morning and, and be like, I get to work, I get to go to work today versus I have to go to work today, you need to change your career because you're not where you should be. And if you're not passionate about what you're doing, you're not going to be as successful um, as as you could be in a career that you're passionate about. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jenna. Uh, Neda, I know growing up in Serbia, you had a fascination with uh, Tesla as a young girl, and then you found yourself in your career working in Tesla, the company. Uh, can you share uh, a little bit about, about that path? Yeah, I still have that fascination, like even today. And frankly, the reason why I went to work there is because of Nikola Tesla. <laughs> I moved across the country and did that. So I have no shame in admitting that whatsoever. He was a superhero to me as a kid. I grew up across the street from a huge statue of him. Uh, and so to this day, you know, he he, he is a inspiration figure to me. I love what Jenna was saying about how men can be allies and mentors. So in addition to Tesla being an inspiration, my father is as well. He was an engineer and and from the beginning, he destigmatized the whole thing. You know, when I would come back and be like, nobody looks like me, there's no other women. He's like, whatever, you know, just who cares? Like, do your thing. You belong here, you know? And, and so, so I think that that was, um, that was really fundamental. So I think the more that we can engage men as allies, as supporters, as mentors, um, that's great. And I think as uh, as uh, Jenna was saying, younger generations are really open to this. So so the timing is perfect uh, to make these changes. Thank you so much, uh, Neda. Uh, Sanya, your career was initially focused on research and academics, and uh, now you're part of a tech company. Uh, what what happened? What what was the uh, breakthrough that happened to to make you uh, do the switch? Well, I think it it was only natural uh, because uh, what really keeps me here is uh, diversity, but not the one we are talking about today. <laughs> it's a different kind of diversity. It's uh, diversity of skills that I need to have in order to do my job. And when I look at the opportunities that are in front of me. That diversity is going to be even more interesting, and that is uh, what I'm really looking forward to. Thank you so much, uh, Myra. Uh, I'm I I know your path was also uh, paved with uh, obstacles that you had to overcome. Um, wh- what was the the breaking moment in which you you realized that the tech industry is is the right fit for you? I'm not sure if I found tech industry or it found me. Um, I never thought I would end up in tech industry. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, I, I come and, and, and my home turf would be finance and corporate finance and all around that, right? And um, and working with the with the, with the counterparts at that time on uh, on basically right uh, what we call the IT side or basically the the. We are in right now intelligent enterprise solutions and working with them, bringing the ideas of how we can do things better, faster, uh, how we can make the the increased automa- automation in finance, basically hold this finance transformation, digitalization, everything. Um, and we talked a lot and it was great. And then um, a couple of years back, because we were working together, uh, then they came and said, you want to do this? Like, you know, you want to connect the the, the the customer and the IV world, you want to help us make the better roadmaps and, and better deliveries. I was like, yes, absolutely. So I'm still 
um, like, you know, I am in a fintech world and I constantly am balancing both, uh, bringing them together. And it's a great place to be because um, similar also to, to what Sanya said, so not only the diversity of the skills and stuff, but it's interesting. You never get bored. Be it that it's it's challenging, be it what you have to learn, be it that the things don't work or whatever, people don't understand each other and, and you know, all kinds of things. You never get bored and it's just amazing. Um, and one thing that 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 was important for me, why I wanted to kind of make this full circle around the finance, doing it from now another side was and maybe also to consider for the future careers for the for the ladies in the call. Um, I always wanted to make a difference. I always wanted to make an impact and to to really do something that I see the value in. You know that that when I look at the end of the day or end of the month or whatever, is that okay? So something changed. I like I helped someone somewhere or something, and that's 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 for example the decisive factor. And I think that the tech industry is a is an amazing place to be to do exactly that. I can agree with that a hundred percent. The best moments I've had in my career are those where I felt the impact of what I was doing, the positive impact. And that is, I think, also something great to consider over the next two days. And that is uh, what kind of impact you can generate with your uh, ideas. We're out of time, unfortunately, because I can't even begin to describe how much I've enjoyed the last hour and a half uh, with all of you. And I want to thank uh, Neda, Jenna, Myra, uh, Gul, and Sanya so much for being with us uh, today. Uh, and also to wish the best of luck to all our participants uh, in the idea marathon over the next uh, over the next two days um, and uh, we'll be seeing all of you again uh, friday at the same time to hear the amazing ideas uh, you come up with thank you so much everybody for joining us tonight thank you thank, thank you so much thank you bye thank you bye, -bye. bye everybody thank you